All right, let's dive in there. It's 11.16. We're a minute late. <laughs> and we're uh, still under budget. We're still under budget. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Uh, Mikkel asks, oh, wait, Angie just joined just in time. Eric's not coming yet. <laughs> That's why. I was like, oh, Eric's not here. He's late. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we can see the puppy problems in action. <laughs> Cool. So uh, Mikkel asks, he says, I have a standard edition 3.7 terabyte database with tables over 10 billion rows and one terabyte. It's running fine with regular maintenance, but any gotchas I should be aware of, uh, Brent? <laughs> Disappeared. Are you trying to dodge a bullet? No, thanks. <laughs> how long do your backups take? That would be my first question. How long do your backups take? How long does CheckDB take? And how long does a restore take? Uh, so I... When you say it's running fine with regular maintenance, that's the part I'd be really curious about. What's the scary part? Is it over 10 billion rows? or well, For me, even, is just the 3.7 terabytes. Because a 10 billion row table, sure, it's big. It's going to take a long time if you have to scan it. But 3.7 terabytes, even if you're really good at backup and restore, that's probably a couple few hours. Um, and I would, that's just at the point where I'd say, hey, how about we archive some of this data to a different database so that I only have to back up that database once a week and I keep the current portion kind of short and small. You can use tricks like a union all between the archive tables and the current tables if you're worried about breaking the application. But it's, that's a lot of data to back up. It's not impossible. It's totally doable. People have larger databases all the time, but standard edition, I kind of go, hmm, it's kind of tight there. Gotcha. Is there anything else you guys would worry about if it was your standard edition 3.7 terabyte database? I'm trying to think of anything. I'd be about worried about uh, you know if they, if they ever need to purge data. You know, how are they going to ha handle that scenario? Oh, you know, are they going to yeah. partition tables? That's a standard edition feature, right? It's not enterprise. No, enterprise. Enterprise. Oh, is it enterprise? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the that's the thing too is that you know I've had tables that are bigger than that, um, and databases that are much bigger. But and that was the thing is well, what's going to be the perf on this? And we you know through partitioning all over that of that beast. Mm -hmm. He follows up and says it takes four hours to back up and restore is around the same. This is where, and he says we purge all the time. That, that's cool. I would just then start breaking data out. What some vendors do is they have a different database for every month or a different database for every year so that that way they can just start new ones and just not take so long to back up and restore the older stuff. Mm -hmm. Brent, do you have any interest in becoming a Scalia's replacement? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, as judgmental as I am, I love judging people, but I don't think I would want to. I don't think I would look very good in the black gown. It sounds slimming, but it's just not my. Not my <laughs> Plus, I think they're really serious, and I would have a hard time not doing jazz hands during like. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> well, let's see here. Um, Lee Townsend, he says that he was at your Friday talk in Vegas at SQL Intersections. When was that? I think that was like a couple months ago, right? October, I think. It was either October or November. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Last October. yeah, that was, uh, yeah, last October. Uh, about HA and DR. I used your RPO, RTO, I mean RTO, RPO sheet. Um, the folks at my place of business um, have much... Uh, a base of business, how much it would be to have that zero zero that they keep demanding from IT, me being the low DVA to set up, um, not a peep sense. Oh, so he used that RPO, RTO sheet to basically introduce to his management. This is how much it's going to cost to get 100% uptime. Man, it's so, over and over again, I thought as a database administrator, I must be missing something because I can't figure out a zero data loss solution that you can build with a can of Pringles, a roll of duct tape, and a you know $5 bill. The reality is it just costs a lot of money and time in order to build a, a zero data loss, zero downtime solution. So if you get our first responder kit, if you go to brenozar.com and click first aid up at the top, we got a, a download pack that's got all kinds of scripts and worksheets. One of them is our RPO and RTO worksheet that you can use to help show your boss, here's how much it would cost to achieve zero data loss, now help me pick a better solution for our budgets. Because it's not, all of us would never lose data if we had the choice, but it's not our choice, it's not our budget money. I hope to God you're not actually paying for your SQL Service data protection out of your own pocket. If you are, it's really time to find a better job. So we're talking about like systems where people can potentially die with any downtime. Mm -hmm. That's really expensive, huh? Yeah, one of one of our clients had uh, has a system that tracks where every hospital patient is, which bed that they're in. 
And so that cannot go down, you know, because if you need to go do rounds or find whose medication it is. So they end up using techniques like printing out the data every 15 minutes. Mm. Uh, so they just have a printer nearby and they can just, whenever the system dies, grab the reports off the printer and that'll give you the last 15 minutes of what's going on. It's a lot of paper. The look on your face is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. I guess yeah. that's a solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, David Tower is thinking that uh, SQL Server reporting solutions. He's heard rumors that Microsoft is quietly phasing this out. Is that true? Have you heard any rumors that they're phasing out SSRS? What do you think, Doug? <laughs> Doug's, Doug's afraid to answer. Can Doug hear us? He's, I, I think Doug's in his own world. He's, he's tuned out. He's <laughs> muted the whole system. Either that, oh, he's probably typing now. Like, I, refuse, I refuse to uh, incriminate myself on the grounds. I, I, don't, I don't think any of us have heard anything about that. Uh, and it seems like they just improved it a bunch in, uh, SS, in CTP 3.2 or 3.3. Um, but I, and that it, was, it looked like a graveyard there for a while. <laughs> and it, I mean, I, Doug's mm -hmm. a straight face barely. What? Oh, oh no, there he is. Uh, ah, yeah, welcome to the party. party. So everybody froze except me, and my my webcam was still live because it was local. So I was looking at you guys and no one time stop. You looked frozen. And I was like waiting if you were like waiting to do something really dramatic, but then nothing happened. No, it was, <laughs> it was the opposite for me. That was fun. So you dodged the perfect. You. Yes. <laughs> You dodged the perfect question. Do you think Microsoft is going to discontinue SSRS? No. Oh, now it locked <laughs> up again, right? Yeah. <laughs> that tells you everything you need to know, I think. There you go. See, now, Doug, today you sound very far away. You sound a little muffled. Do I? Where's your okay. Yeti? Well, this is actually the, the microphone <laughs> you use to record, like, videos. So, um, uh, but I may have a, maybe the gain's turned down. Hang on. How about now? Sounds, sounds good. Well, now that I can see your microphone, I'm like, oh, that needs, sounds good. She just needs to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are we all, do I need to go to closet and show my other mics? Is that is that what we need to do now? <laughs> uh, Mic off. <laughs> let's see. What do you guys think about partitioning windows? Pros, cons? So there's a few. You may you ask a clarification question when when you say partitioning windows because it could be you're talking about Windows file partitions like Windows Drive partitions. Or you could be talking about sliding windows in queries like partitioning functions, or you could be talking about partition tables. Go a little bit into more of the pain that you're facing and what you're thinking about doing to fix it, and then we can drill into further detail there. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Question from Todd. He says I have a four terabyte and a twenty five terabyte with 4,400 and uh, let's see, 47,500 VLFs, um, waiting on outage window to shrink and change growth settings. Any concerns? I'm concerned that you have a 25 terabyte database, but. <laughs> <laughs> 25 terabytes, so I think the highest I've heard um, on a sales call is 80. Yeah, wow. I had a 45 minute yeah, outage due to that number of VLFs a few years ago. We it was uh, yeah, a patch. I believe we were doing Windows patching, yeah, monthly patching, and rebooted SQL Server. Rebooted the server, and a, a, an extremely critical database took 45 minutes to complete recovery due to the, due to the number of VLFs. Although I didn't know about Ooh. VLFs at the time, Ooh. when it finally came online, we were just so excited that you know we didn't have to <laughs> restore or anything like that. But we contacted Microsoft the next day, and this is when I learned about VLFs, and I've been monitoring them ever since. <laughs> Oh. I, I, I do the I do the shrinks and um, I do these live. I, I I've done it on on critical databases without a maintenance window. You know, I, I put in a change request. You know, so that the organization knows, so that the NOC knows that um, you know maintenance is occurring, but not within like a, a maintenance window at night during a slow period. Now you, you do have the issue out the log file again where you don't have instant file initialization, but maybe your growths are aren't going to be too large to cause a a major problem. But I've done this during the day during busy times. Mm -hmm. You don't have your background anymore. She's she did it. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the, she did. 
it doesn't look too bad. You can tell from the the window right there; it's really bright outside. It just it does. I mean, that's not what it looks like, but from, yeah, from my my um, vantage point. But from here, it it looks really bright. Yeah, let's look I was at just it. I, I put the thing up because I was afraid of how bright that window would be, or that it's it's a large sliding glass door. Yeah, no, it looks good. Uh, let's see. Question from Adam. He says, "My boss wants to consolidate SQL and IAS into one server to lower costs." Ah! I have one <laughs> no! <laughs> he says he's warned against this, but if we must, if we limit the SQL max memory more than usual, is utilizing the buffer pool extension a viable option to protect against memory pressure from IIS? No, Any no, no, and no. <laughs> nope. So elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean... Why are You're you right. consolidating? What is what is the is there a licensing issue with IS? I mean, a v, is there a what, what are we? Why are we trying to consolidate these two things onto one box? What, what pain point are you trying to um, solve here? Because I think that you're going to create a larger pain point by doing this. Mm -hmm. the web servers are so cheap. Yeah. Yep. Laptop grade hardware. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, even if, if you play the devil's advocate of saying, oh, SQL's way overpowered right now, it just makes your troubleshooting job harder. That's uh, And then to answer the other part of your question, is buffer pool extensions a viable option? No, it's not a good thing in terms of performance. If you search on brenozar.com for buffer pool extensions, Jeremiah Peshka wrote a great post explaining the performance gotchas with it. Uh, it's I've never seen an environment where that was the answer, and it actually worked. What is the worst SQL-related requ request you've ever gotten from management? That's like we need to do this, and you must. Oh wow, so many. <laughs> what was the one thing where you're like, I gotta? No, I'm gonna put my foot down here. This is this is terrible. <laughs> this is not gonna oh, happen. Man. I mean, I, I have just an, a, a small example. I mean, during you know a critical outage, you know. It's, Busy working on it on an issue with like 30 people on a conference call, all giving their opinion of what of what the problem is, and and not allowing the DBA team to really dig into it. And we just hear all this chatter, 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 and we're trying to you know resolve an issue, and a someone in um, you know, really high up in management you know suggested that I restart SQL Server to see if that would help things, and I, I put him off for like 30 minutes, you know, because I was like. That's not going to solve the problem. But you know, 30 minutes later, I'm just like, you know, I didn't have a solution yet. I said we were still digging into it, and I was like, I'm going to re restart it so that he stops asking that, and to show that it's not going to, it's not going to do anything. All it did was waste time. You know, waste of, you know, say five minutes of time. You know, and let's get back to troubleshooting this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, then you lose, you lose all those stats as well, right? You do lose everything. I think this was on a, a much lower version of SQL Server where we didn't have all this good data to look through. Oh. Yeah, I don't even remember what the, what the issue was, but you know, mm -hmm. it's just it's a, it's a very small um, you know, small example. Another example is just you know the, the um, you know a, a primary site and a, and a DR site and having active active sites. You know that that discussion came up you know, every every two years and every two years we you know we didn't have the the Brent Ozar you know um, document at the time to say you know, here's <laughs> Cost, but yeah, you know, we went to the vendors, you know, the sand vendors, and you know, and they gave us those large you know, price tags. And you know, every two years, here you go. You know, it's still the same answer. It's still a a lot of money. Mm. The worst one that I remember was I didn't get asked. My manager just went and did it. Multi terabyte SAP database, and for some reason something went wrong, and there was stuff rolling back. And he restarted the SQL Server trying to mm -hmm. fix that, and that didn't work. Then the whole database was unavailable. He's like, "Well, I know it has something to do with the log file, so I'm just going to delete the log file and keep going." Yeah. And of course, then yeah, SQL Server comes up, and things get even worse. So and then at that point, I get the phone call. I'm like, "Why the hell didn't I get the phone call earlier when you were do all this evil can evil stuff?" But. <laughs> Why did that person have the access to do that? Windows administrators, so people mm. who are on the Windows team, you know, we end up being super users on all the boxes, so. Those evil sysadmins. Yeah. <laughs> we had to stop doing backups on one of our most critical databases. It was like 800 gigs, which was almost twice the size of most of our other clients. And uh, they started noti noticing pressure they're, oh, we have a slower response time. It's like 10 milliseconds slower than it was an hour ago. What are you guys doing? And someone got the bright idea to tell them that it was our backups. And so then we, they were like, oh, you have to stop doing these. So somebody <laughs> in our business said to stop oh, no. doing backups so that the client wouldn't see it. 
Uh, that was probably the worst thing that came from higher up. Well, they won't see it all right, and by it, I mean the <laughs> database. <laughs> Um, let's see. Let's move on to a question from Jennifer. She says, for ETL file operations, do you prefer CLR or SSIS? Definitely not CLR. Yeah. And why not? Why not? I just don't think it's the right tool to be doing you know, <laughs> right. uh, you know, work with files. I mean, PowerShell, SSIS, I mean, there are just better tools out there to use. The thing I really so, love about avoiding, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, if you do something in CLR and you are not available to fix it, how many other people are going to know how to fix that up in CLR versus looking something up on the internet for SSIS and getting the solution there? And what, what access did you have to provide to the database for that, for that file operation? Isn't that you know, yeah. the unsafe, um, unsafe, whatever it is on the database level for CLR file operations? Well, yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's not even like the SQL CLR versus SSIS. It's more like, okay, if you go to CLR, go C Sharp on a server processing files, doing all that work, mm -hmm. and then sending it to a database using bulk load or whatever versus SSIS, not a, a CLR and SQL CLR. I, I think I, I've, I've weighed both pluses and minuses. I've done both. It, it depends on your team, what they're good with, what they're... Uh, what they're comfortable with, what kind of data, how, what the frequency of data is. I mean, there's there's a lot of different things. I think my biggest thing against SSIS, it's not easy to test. It's just not an easy thing to go through and do unit testing and making sure things are right, where it's a lot easier using a, a C-sharp application to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Brent, have you been keeping up with the uh, SQL Server updates? I have, yes. Mm. Oh, so you're... the slides, so somebody's asking about the slides, so we don't change the picture on the slide every time. It's like the picture on my driver's license. It doesn't change in real time as I get older. Thank God. <laughs> the picture on the slide does not change. The important stuff isn't the picture. The important stuff is you go to the website. You go get the downloads there. Well, I, I have so. to make a note about that on the slide. <laughs> yes, I put a little asterisk. This is not real time. It's a picture. Pictures of websites don't update. <laughs> Uh, do you guys have any tips on getting an MCSA certification? Oh Why? boy, did we pick the right <laughs> <laughs> rent? That's okay. So uh, we should have a quick uh, answer. How many of us have taken a for each person? Have you taken a Microsoft test in the last year or two, and why? Uh, I tried to binge actually to update my 2008 certs to 2012. And um, my experience throughout with Microsoft testing is, is that it's very uh, pedantic. It, work, it focuses on, um, on just knowledge retention as opposed to how would you actually accomplish something. The tests are getting better, but, um, but yeah, the, the big concern for me is that uh, these tests don't, don't really tell, like if you're doing it for for a resume builder, they don't really tell anyone what you know and what you're capable of doing. Yeah, so it's everybody's always afraid to, to piss off Microsoft, but not me. So here goes. <laughs> um, we don't we don't require employees to take certification tests uh, ever. If people want to go for it, that's totally cool. But the certification tests have nothing to do with what you do on a daily basis. I've never gone into a uh, like MCSE type test and gone. This perfectly reflects my daily job duties. I am, as I say that, I have a license plate on my desk for the Microsoft Certified Master uh, thing, like a little you know, license plate frame that Microsoft just sent, so I should be much more kind about certification exams. Well, that, that one's more... different, though. Yes. That, that one actually means something. I mean, that one really means... Well, you know, I used to, server. at least. <laughs> it means you're a dinosaur Yes, this was this one involved a lab test where you had like a six-hour lab test, and it was it was hard as hell. I, like it was the best experience for the, simulating the DBA lifestyle that I've ever seen. Uh, but yeah, the rest of the paper tests just don't aren't that impressive. You have to, for, for the for the other tests, you you have to be a good test taker, which is one of the reasons why I have not attempted to take the test because I am not a good test taker. But the certified master, you have, to, you have to actually know what you're doing. You don't have to. The, the other ones, you really, you could just you know, make your way through a test and get a certification. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yep. Right? Or right. just no XML, right? I mean, that's, that's yeah. Right. Yeah, there's that too. So yeah. many XML questions. It's like, what? Oh. <laughs> Brent, actually, you blogged about your experience getting that certification, right? Yeah, if you search for Brentos RMCM, I had a series of blog posts. I actually live blogged the whole time I was going through the process because it was a three-week-long thing. You had to be on-site in my, at Microsoft. You had all these really intense efforts. So I blogged about my preparation efforts and what it was like going through the program. It was phenomenal. At the time, it cost $20,000 and took three weeks out of your life. I mean, you weren't billable that whole time. If you're an employee, you had to get three weeks worth of vacation. Microsoft discontinued that, and it, it's really a bummer because it was kind of like going through battle. You know, you formed a real bond with the other people who were in the class with you, and I still talk to a lot of those guys today. But yeah, now we're back down to some multiple choice, mark C a bunch of times, and hope it's right kind of test. And on, on as far as our consulting clients go, I think it's probably I've, I've probably gotten two, two, two prospects that are like, what kind of certifications do your consultants have? Um, mm -hmm. So it, I don't I don't find that it's crazy necessary for for all you know everybody to have certifications to do consulting work either. I was it's not important for jobs either. Like we've never asked the question. I had no idea until our people get hired. I'm like, oh Richie and Tara, do you guys have any certifications? <laughs> I'm supposed to be from somewhere or something. Um, but it's the same thing for anybody out there. If you want to go get a better job, the secret isn't having a paper test. The secret is go out and share what you know, blog, help people in the community, go out to SQL Saturdays and community events, ask questions of the presenters, talk to them afterwards. The people who are in your local community, these meat bags that you're afraid to talk to, they're the ones who are going to get you your next jobs. It's not the certification. You want to get to the point where you're not even generating a resume. You're just talking to someone and going, hey, I'm thinking about you know finding my next new challenge. What have you guys got available? And they go, oh, tell me more about your life and what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now let's move on to a question from Garrett. He says, why does dramatic why does deleting the MSDB backup restore history dramatically speed up backups and restores? Um, I recently uh, I, I noticed that completely empty MSDB tables result in twice as fast backups and restores. Even having less even having less than ten rows, those tables can um, those tables cause the commands to run up to twice as slow? How can a mere handful of rows cause such a variance in backup and restore performance? Because you got a crappy server and you put MSDB on the C drive. <laughs> put if you so for future reference, the next time you build a server, put MSDB on the same places that you've got your user databases. It's probably much faster storage instead of a crappy you know SATA hard drive. Um, but this is a known issue. If you search on our site for MSDB bottleneck, I wrote a blog post like probably 10 years ago talking about this exact problem. Microsoft never really designed these tables to be, you know, big load, you know, OLTP type things. But um, you end up with third-party tools that are constantly querying these tables to check and see if your databases have been backed up. So, just we advise people, and it's in SP Blitz. If you use SP Blitz, our free health check utility, I want to say we alert if it's more than 30 days worth of history in there. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Is is uh is SP Ask Brent up to date? Did we just recently do an update, or was the last time we updated that? Two. It was January first or January fourth. I remember working on it on New Year's Day. I think I released it the day afterwards. This is my life. Welcome to my life. <laughs> uh, so, how often do you do we come up with new versions of those? Well, that's a great question. Doug's working on SP Blitz Index. Uh, he's talk about the version of new version of SP Blitz Index that you're working on. Yeah, so there's some fun stuff coming with that. Um, we've split things out so that when you run it in its default mode zero, it kind of gives you just the important stuff because it would tend to explain everything that it found, and that's not if you just want kind of the, the important stuff. It's it's kind of boiled down now. Um, also, there is a way that you can run it against all your databases and get all the results in one set. Uh, if you have more than a certain number of databases, I think it's 50, then you have to override the fact that it's going to say you really shouldn't do this against 50 databases. Um, but you can do that too. Uh, there's some other stuff too. The, um, uh, the findings have been rearranged a little bit. Uh, you get things like... Um, the missing index benefit number. I think uh, I'm trying to remember what the change is that I made with that. But it's just it's easier to read some of that stuff now. 
<laughs> oh, I know what it was. Sorry. Uh, the, uh, the missing index benefit number has changed now because it used to um, not really in any way account for uptime. So if you had like a missing index benefit of 10 million, that would mean something very different on a server that's been up two weeks as opposed to a server that's been up for a year. So now it, it's the threshold is, I think, 2 million um, whatever query bucks a day of uptime is what sort of triggers the threshold for you should really do this index. And then we got uh, Eric's working on a new version of SP Blitz. Did I, did I say that right? I think Eric's working on SP Blitz Cache, or I am. Someone is. I know it's been a long day already. Um, but yeah, we tend to try and drop them out once a month. Um, SPS Rent hasn't been updated since January 1st, but we cycle them around between different versions. I got some ideas on stuff I want to do for SPS Rent probably next month, probably in March. What's the hardest one to maintain? God, both SP Blitz Index and SP Blitz Cache are pretty rough. SP Blitz Cache does XML, but SP Blitz Index has some monster temp tables. Doug was, I was, I went in to look at yeah. Doug's code. I'm like, oh god. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote for Blitz Cache on that one just because there's much more dynamic SQL in it, which is really hard to track through. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I, I'm working on SP Blitz Cache because I have a bug in it. I have a bug in my dynamic SQL at the moment, and it's, ugh, nasty. <laughs> What are you doing, Richie? I need that fixed, by the way. I, need, I know, I know, I'm working on it, I'm trying. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, question from Billy. He says, if you have an asynchronous availability group replica that is being used as a readable reporting server, what are some best practices that end users should abide by to prevent redo queue buildup? Don't query the server. <laughs> Don't query the server, it'll be much faster, much faster. And so I usually say this in jest, uh, always on availability groups, have a bottleneck around the redo queue. There's one CPU core per database, if I remember right, like one thread per database, it'll do redo queue. So it can just get backed up. There's improvements in that coming in SQL Server 2016, although we don't know exactly what they are yet. They've just said like multi-threaded redo, and we don't really have specifics yet. So. Uh, yeah, don't uh, query the database. There's also why people will say, I, I am going to have replicas that are dedicated for DR or for HA, and then the reporting replicas I'm going to use are going to be different, just so that that way I can fail over with as little data loss as possible. Mm -hmm. All right, Tara, did, and I should ask, did, have you ever run into the redo queue being a problem? I don't know that that was specifically the problem because I maybe didn't have the knowledge to look at that, um, but I, we definitely had issues um, on all of the replicas. Um, the load on the um, primary replica would cause um, blocking and just slow performance on the uh, um, you know, synchronous and asynchronous replicas. And you know, maybe it was that. I don't know. All right. Chris is wondering if we have any tricks to help ensure that you don't accidentally run an update or delete on a production server. I have a I have a good, good suggestion on that one. Um, you know, it would cost money, but you know, if you purchase the SSMS tools pack, um, that will it's a it's a plugin that gets added to uh, Management Studio, and it um, it will have everything be in a in a transaction, I believe, at, by default, and it'll ask you um, if you if you really meant to run an update without a where clause, you know, a delete without a where clause, things like that. As long as you know that that's I'm um, running, you know, you will get that warning. But you know, as far as an update that does. What's that? Unless you disable that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it definitely has saved me. It's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for mm -hmm. stopping me destroying production. <laughs> gotcha. You could also turn on explicit transactions within uh, Management Studio like um, Oracle tools do. Yeah. But, um, yep. you know, that's not something that we're used to in the SQL Server world. What is that? I've never heard of this. Yeah, so I think it's, I mean, Lisa, it was available in older versions, you know, I, I haven't t taken a look in um, you know, 2012, but it used to be in, like, in the tools menu that you could turn turn that on just like, um, you know, Oracle Toad, um, you know, would use, yeah. um, you'd always have to commit or roll back a transaction. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Wow. I gotta play with and I think that. it's also a set option, you know, um, that you could, you could do in your query window. Neato. Eric just posted, Eric's latest blog post is Oracle related, isn't it? <laughs> Running a week straight. Yeah, like uh, every day this week he's kind of got a different Oracle post lined up. Strings, dates, um, numbers, how it's all different in Oracle than SQL Server. 
-hmm. And I've had people say, why would you run Oracle posts or a SQL Server blog? If you're really passionate about databases, it's really neat to see how other databases do stuff. I like reading Eric's stuff and just going, oh, wow, is that how, man, they got cool some cool functions. And they have some things that we don't have. Like one number format? How awesome is that? They just have one data type for numbers. None of this decimal, you know, float, int, tiny int. They just have one number. It's a number. Mm. Yeah, it's, well, also, you, can, um, you can upvote features on Connect that Oracle has that you really want to see SQL Server have. If you don't know these features exist, then you'll never be clamoring for them. Oh. Is this, just an in this is just an interest of Eric's. He's never actually managed an Oracle instance or database. I have no idea. He might have. <laughs> And and because oh, with a lot of SQL that Server shows. Early before hiring him, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know everything you people touched in your sordid careers. <laughs> Neither do I. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Cool. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Bye, everybody, and we will see you next week on Office Hours. <laughs>